it's my uh, great privilege to be able to welcome you to, to tonight's presentation, New Testament Manuscripts and the Earliest Visual Depiction of the Crucified Christ. After completing his undergraduate and Master of Divinity degrees, Dieter Roth earned his PhD from the University of Edinburgh with a dissertation on the text of uh, Marcion's Gospel. Uh, Marcion, I, when I was talking about Marcion, uh, the, uh, my professor was pronouncing his name Martian, which you sometimes hear. So this is Marcion with a C, not M-A-R-T-I-N, Martian, uh, Marcion's Gospel. From 2010 through 19, he held a position at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany, and wrote his Habilitation Schrift on the Parables in Q, which is the postulated second major source alongside the Gospel of Mark for the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Dr. Roth joined the faculty of Boston College Theology Department this past fall as an assistant professor of New Testament. In addition to his research interests and publications concerning Marcion and the parables, Dr. Roth works on New Testament textual criticism and early manuscripts. His two, manu his two monographs, uh, 2015, the text of Marcion's Gospel, was published by Brill as part of the New Testament Tools, Studies, and Documents series. And in 2018, he published the parables in Q, uh, published by T.N.T. Clark, part of the Library of New Testament Studies. His presentation this evening draws on these interests as he will offer a lecture on the starogram as the earliest iconographic depiction of the crucified Christ. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our new colleague at Boston College and our presenter tonight, Dr. Dieter Rahn. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it is my distinct pleasure to be here this evening. Let me add my own word of warm welcome to esteemed colleagues, to students, to members of the public. Thank you for being here this evening and being willing to take four or five hours out of your Thursday evening to... <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. We will stick to the time schedule, but in all seriousness, thank you for being here this evening. I do hope at the end of our time together, you will have the sense that it was an educational, an informative, and an enjoyable evening. And if that's the case, feel free at the end of the evening to let me know. Uh, if it's not the case, feel free at the end of the evening just to leave without letting me know. As was advertised and just mentioned, my lecture this evening has to do with New Testament manuscripts and the earliest visual depiction of the crucified Christ. Now, presumably many of you may be familiar with or at least will have at some point heard the term icon. And as some of you may know, when speaking about the depiction of, in particular, religious themes or religious figures, the field of study in which one is moving is that of iconology or iconography. And when considering the study of iconography as a scholarly discipline, one of the most important figures of the 20th century was a gentleman named Erwin Panofsky, 1892 to 1968. He was professor of art history at the University of Hamburg before he was forced to emigrate to the United States because of the rise of the Nazi regime in Germany. Panofsky presented a particularly important and significant framework for iconographical interpretation in his 1939 volume entitled Studies in Iconology, Humanistic Themes in the Art of the Renaissance, and his 1955 work, Meaning in the Visual Arts. Now, Panofsky set forth three levels or strata in the study of art, namely the primary or natural subject matter, which he called the pre-iconographical description, 
the secondary or conventional subject matter, which he called the iconographical analysis in the narrower sense, and the intrinsic meaning or content, the iconographical interpretation in a deeper sense. Now, before these references to the study of art cause some of you to wonder whether you have perhaps wandered into the wrong lecture, let me explain my purpose in briefly mentioning these levels of Panofsky's model of the study of iconography. It's not to engender a discussion concerning interpretive methodologies in the study of art or art history. I am decidedly unqualified to lead such a discussion. Rather, the purpose is simply to provide a context for posing the following question. When one imagines an iconographical object that is being described, analyzed, and interpreted, what types of objects come to mind? More specifically, and more to the point of the focus of the present discussion, what depictions of Jesus come to mind? Among those things probably envisioned most often are perhaps a famous painting, such as Da Vinci's The Last Supper, or Raphael's Transfiguration, or maybe Dali's Christ of St. John of the Cross or possibly a mosaic in a Christian church. Here you see two photographs that I took of mosaics at the Baptistry of St. Lydia near Philippi in Greece. And with thoughts turning to paintings or mosaics, a lecture on Christian art and the earliest depiction of the crucified Christ might be the type of presentation one would expect to hear. I would venture to guess, however, that when one thinks of the iconographical reception of Jesus, it would be presumably significantly less common for the first thing to enter your mind to be a papyrus manuscript of the New Testament. Now, if you're thinking, yes, indeed, a papyrus manuscript of the New Testament would not be the first thing to enter my mind because I've never seen or even heard of a papyrus manuscript of the New Testament, that's okay. Okay. And you can be quite pleased that only a few minutes into the evening, your continuing education is already taking place. <laughs> New Testament papyrus manuscripts are our earliest copies of New Testament texts. The manuscripts are made of strips of the papyrus plant, and some of them date from the second century of the Common Era. As manuscripts of the New Testament quite understandable for New Testament papyri to be most often conceived of as witnesses for various readings of the biblical text, and thus associated first and foremost with the words found on their pages. And yet, recent scholarship has become increasingly aware of the fact that the earliest extant New Testament papyri are not merely receptacles for words but are also the earliest Christian artifacts. As Larry Hurtado stated, and Hurtado was my doctoral supervisor, unfortunately recently deceased, and he was one of the individuals to whom I am indebted for my own interest in New Testament manuscripts. As Larry Hurtado stated, New Testament manuscripts such as this one contain metadata. That is, quote, the data given in manuscripts beyond the readings of the texts that they convey. And one element of these metadata appears to contain a surprising and often overlooked visual representation of Jesus. More on this in a moment. But first, how many of you have ever seen a symbol that is used to represent Jesus? The best known one is called the key row, so called because it is a ligature that is two letters that are written together 
And those two letters are the Greek letters, key and rho. These two letters are also the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. And on the right side of the slide here, you can see Jesus Christ written in Greek and the highlighted letters, the key and the rho, that are written together to form the key rho. In antiquity, the symbol can be found in numerous contexts, including on coins, as can be seen here, for instance, on a coin of actually a usurper, Roman Empire named Magnentius, from the middle of the 4th century CE. In contemporary Christianity, the symbol is often found in churches or on vestments, that are worn in some Christian services of worship. There are further symbols for Jesus, including the iota chi, which is a ligature of the first letters of Jesus and of Christ. You can see this symbol on a sarcophagus from the 4th century in Constantinople. Furthermore, there is a ligature of the first two letters of Jesus called the Iota Eta, to which we find reference in church fathers, including Clement of Alexandria in the late second century. Now, even if you have never taken any Greek and are not all that familiar with the Greek alphabet, you can still see that these symbols have all been created by combining letters found in the words Jesus Christ. There is, however, a fourth symbol that is called a stourgram. A quite famous stourgram, which also happened to be used on the website and the printed advertisements for this lecture, is found in the dome of the Baptistry of San Giovanni and Fonte in Naples, Italy. One also finds it written at the end of the book of Isaiah, in the very important 4th century biblical manuscript that we call Sinaiticus. It's written here above the name Isaiah. But what is interesting is that the Stourgram doesn't first appear as a freestanding symbol for Jesus Christ, as you have just seen here. It certainly is the case that in the 4th century, and this is, of course, after the conversion of Constantine, and the official religion of the Roman Empire becoming Christianity, that we see the rather rapid proliferation of these symbols for Christ on a whole series of Christian monuments. However, as early as 1967, a German scholar named Erich Dinkler published a collection of essays entitled Signum Crucis, Sign of the Cross. And in this work, he observed the following. Well, I just told you he was German, so <laughs> of course he wrote in German. But don't worry, we'll do all these quotes in English. He wrote, one generally overlooks that already in the first quarter of the second century AD, a different genre of witnesses appears, which in an extended sense are to be considered Christian monuments, the oldest papyri containing New Testament texts. Without a doubt, these are literary sources, but as papyrus discoveries, they are also archaeological monuments that reveal through their texts that they have been crafted by Christians. The reason why this is significant for us is because it is in these papyrus manuscripts that one first finds the Stourgram. In fact, where it is found in these papyrus manuscripts is the reason why it is called a stourgram. I just mentioned and illustrated that three of the four symbols we looked at were formed on the basis of letters found in the words Jesus Christ. The stourgram is first found in the Greek word stauros, which is the Greek word for cross, or the related word to crucify, uh, I've here written the noun in Greek capital letters and have transliterated it into English characters below. Now what happens in many instances in our earliest New Testament manuscripts is that this word cross becomes abbreviated in a certain way. And when it is abbreviated, a horizontal line is placed above the abbreviation. So if we think of this kind of step-by-step 
The word is abbreviated, vowels in the middle drop out, and a superlinear stroke is written above the abbreviation. Then, in this abbreviation, the ligature between the Greek letters for T, the tau, and R, the rho, is created so that one ends up with an abbreviated form of the word for cross with this ligature, these two letters written together, this compendium that we call a stourogram. Now, I'm going to put that picture of the New Testament papyrus I showed you before back up on the screen. You're looking at a section of a papyrus called P75, and in this section, we can read Luke 14, 27. And just in case you don't all have Luke 14, 27 memorized, it says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, just looking at the manuscript and the letters or markings that you see here, and in the light of what I have just said, do you notice anything that you may not have noticed before? Right here. This is what says cross in Luke 14.27. I'll enlarge it for you. Despite a little bit of pixelization, you'll notice exactly what I just explained. The word for cross has been abbreviated. A superlinear stroke has been written, and the tau and the rho have been written together as a ligature to form a stourogram. Now, if I bring back the larger section of text. And if you look across it, again, even if you don't know any Greek, do you see any other lines above words indicating abbreviations? Do you see any other letters written together as a ligature? No? Yes? Circles and lines, well, superlinear stroke, letters written together, well, we've got that in that one spot. We have some other letters that are formed with lines, but it's the only place here. And so you might raise the question, why is cross abbreviated? Why is there a superlinear stroke? Why are these two letters written together? And I would say... Great questions. It's precisely these three things that we want to take a closer look at, namely the issue of abbreviations, this superlinear stroke, and then the stourogram. As is the case in nearly every era and in nearly every language, abbreviations were used in antiquity and in the historical context surrounding the New Testament. In the environment surrounding early Christianity, one of the places in which one would have most often encountered abbreviations is on coins. This, of course, makes perfect sense because there's a limited amount of space on a coin. And when one has a whole series of honorific titles, and Roman emperors loved their honorific titles, you needed to abbreviate those titles in order to make them fit. So here's a coin from the time of Domitian, emperor from 81 to 96 CE. And along the edge of the coin, we could see a series of abbreviations. First, there is imp. Now, this is not a title given to Domitian like Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones, right? It's an abbreviation for imperator, for emperor. Following that, we have an abbreviation or Caesar, Caesar. Then this is his name that extends around here, Domitianus, followed by Og, for Augustus, meaning majestic, and finally P.M., Pontifex Maximus, chief priest. Right, so now by using abbreviations, one could include multiple titles in limited space, and the use of abbreviations makes perfect sense. You don't have enough room for the entire words, so you abbreviate them so that they fit. Yet the issue of limited space 
doesn't appear to be an issue for New Testament manuscripts. When we look at the manuscripts, we have the margins on the top, on the bottom, on both sides, quite large. Space between the rows of letters, letters that are not written extremely small, that all tends to point to the fact that it's, it's not a lack of space that has led to abbreviation, such as the one for Stauros that we just considered. In a manuscript, unlike on a coin, one generally was not at a loss for space. At the same time, coins such as this one or inscriptions on monuments means that at the very least, people were familiar with seeing abbreviations being used, especially for honorific titles. In Greek literary texts, a massive survey done by Kathleen McNamee and published in her Abbreviations in Greek Literary Papyri and Ostraca, she came to the conclusion that, quote, abbreviations can be found in literary texts dating from the 3rd century BC to the 7th century of our era, but in papyri or ostraca copied before the 1st century BC, they are rare. One does find abbreviations somewhat more often in documentary papyri, that is papyri recording contracts or bills of sale, property lists, etc., in McNamee's study, she also discovered that the abbreviations in literary papyri or ostraca, that's a potsherd used as a writing surface, are almost always created by what we call suspension and only rarely by contraction. So suspension is an abbreviation when the first couple of letters of the word are written and then the remaining letters of the word are omitted, they're suspended. And contraction occurs when the first and last letter are written and a series of medial letters drop out and are omitted. Just how lopsided this is in the papyri becomes apparent when one sees that McNamee's list of abbreviations by suspension runs to 113 pages. 113 pages of abbreviations by suspension. Whereas the abbreviations by contraction, they can be summarized on a single page in an appendix. Now this observation about that ratio is especially interesting when we turn to a pattern of abbreviations that we find in New Testament texts. We find a series of abbreviations in New Testament manuscripts and ever since the groundbreaking 1907 work by Ludwig Traube, these have been called nomina sacra. Title in English to his work would read nomina sacra, that is sacred names, attempt at a history of Christian abbreviation. These abbreviations, these nomina sacra, are found so often in Christian texts that papyrologists are often comfortable assigning a Christian provenance to a text based simply upon the presence of nomina sacra or a single nomen sacrum. Though there are quite a few nomina sacra in New Testament manuscripts, four words in particular are written most often as nomina sacra. They are theos, God, kurios, Lord, Christos, Christ, and Jesus, Jesus. Now, in a marked contrast to what we find in other papyri, these words are almost always abbreviated by contraction. That is, the first and the last letter are written with the medial letters omitted. And in addition, as we already saw with the word stauros, a superlinear stroke is written above the abbreviation. Here, one can see an example of this in an actual manuscript with a section of 1 Corinthians 2.14 where pneumos tu theu, that is spirit of God, is written with nomina sacra. The abbreviations are by contraction and with a superlinear stroke. 
they have an appearance that is quite different from abbreviations found in other Greek texts. In this instance, this type of abbreviating, writing with a superlinear stroke, Christian scribal culture is presenting itself in a somewhat unique manner. In addition, we don't have any indication that these words would have been read any differently. That's to say, nomina sacra seem to be purely visual phenomena. Only those who wrote a manuscript or those who read and saw a manuscript would be able to see or take notice of these abbreviations. And as already noted, since the abbreviations cannot really be explained as coming about due to a lack of space, the question presents itself. Why did Christians create these abbreviations? And since early Christians did not abbreviate any old words, but names and words of particular theological and religious significance, many scholars, in my view rightly, see here not simply a textual phenomenon, but a visual phenomenon related to important aspects of Christian faith and belief. Okay, so maybe it makes a bit of sense that something special is being done with the words God, or Lord, or Jesus, or Christ, for theological or religious reasons. But what's going on with that superlinear stroke? For other Greek abbreviations, that's not normal. It's not normal for abbreviations in antiquity. But it is completely normal for something else. Question. What is written here? I would wager that for essentially everyone in the room, your immediate thought was mill, right? You read that as a word spelled M-I-L-L. But what if I were to tell you that this was found on a receipt? And instead of being the word mill, it indicates what was purchased at a mill, namely 1,001 pounds of flour, 50 pounds of oats, and 50 pounds of barley. Now, admittedly, that would be a curious way of writing the receipt, but my point is that which we immediately read as Roman letters could also be Roman numerals. Now, we, of course, are used to writing with Roman letters and using Arabic numerals, so there's hardly any opportunity for confusion. But if you're writing with Roman letters and Roman numerals, which look the same, how do you know if it's a letter or a number? The same question applies in Greek, where Greek letters were also used to write numbers. And the way that you indicated in a Greek manuscript that what you had written was a number and not letters was by adding, take a guess, a superlinear stroke. This line indicated that what was written beneath is not to be read as letters, but as numbers. Thus, a second point to add to our consideration of papyri is that though the use of a superlinear stroke for an abbreviation is not known elsewhere, its use for numbers is commonplace. This at least raises the question, could there be a connection between nomina sacra and numbers? And in a 1998 article, Larry Hurtado suggested that this may be the case. On the slide, you still see the point I just made concerning the manner in which abbreviations are almost always found outside of New Testament texts by suspension. And I just finished explaining that almost always the New Testament manuscript evidence, the abbreviations are by contraction. Almost always. There is one notable exception involving the name Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is also found abbreviated by suspension. That is, the abbreviation is created by writing the first two letters, iota and eta, and omitting the rest of the word. And of course, let's not forget our superlinear stroke. 
In a manuscript, it looks like this. Thus, one of the abbreviations for Jesus is an iota eta. But iota eta is also the Greek number 18. So, is this a word or a number? Hurtado's theory involves the fact that the Hebrew word for life, spelled with two letters, chet yod, also has a numerical value of 18. And since the New Testament often associates Jesus with life, Hurtado suggested that this connection may also have been created through this shared number 18, which would explain why the Namana Sacra ended up being written with a superlinear stroke. It's a numerical connection. Now, even if one is not persuaded by this particular position, and it has been debated, the association of Jesus with the number 18 indisputably occurred in early Christianity. In a late 1st or early 2nd century CE text entitled The Epistle of Barnabas, one finds a very interesting passage in chapter 9. In 9.7 we read, Learn abundantly, therefore, children of love, about everything. Abraham, who first instituted circumcision, looked forward in the spirit to Jesus when he circumcised, having received the teaching of the three letters. And what, you may ask, is this cryptic teaching of the three letters? Well, thankfully, in 9.8, the author continues, for the scripture says, and Abraham circumcised 318 men of his household. This is in Genesis 14.14 and 17.27. What, then, was the knowledge given to him in this? Learn the 18 first and then the 300. The 10 and the 8 are thus denoted, 10 by I, Iota, and 8 by E, Eta. You have Jesus, Iota, Eta. And because the cross was to express grace by the letter T, the Tau, he also says 300. Abraham, therefore, signifies Jesus by two letters, 18, and the cross by one, 300. Abraham, according to the author, looked forward in the spirit to Jesus because the number 318 is numerically related to Jesus, two letters being both 18 and the abbreviation of Jesus' name, and the cross, a tau being both 300 and a depiction, the shape of the cross. Now, regardless of whether 18 actually ends up providing some insight into the origin of the Namana Sacra or not, it is abundantly clear, and this suffices for our purposes, that Namana Sacra were written with a superlinear stroke, and thus that the abbreviation of Stauros, the word for cross, belongs to these nomina sacra. There are more than a dozen words that are, at least at times, abbreviated as nomina sacra, and it's striking to note that cross, or the related crucify, is, after the four most common nomina sacra, God, Lord, Christ, and Jesus, it's the fifth most common nomen sacrum in early New Testament manuscripts. And yet, isn't it curious that this fifth most common sacred name is not really a name at all, sacred or otherwise? So why was cross so important? And why was it also written as a nomen sacrum? And here we might find some clues in reflections involving the cross in early Christian literature. For as one moves into the Christian literature of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, one finds appeals made to symbols of the cross in theological reflection and argumentation. First, an individual, Justin Martyr, writing in the middle of the 2nd century, observed in chapter 55 of his first apology, For consider all the things in the world. Whether anything is transacted, any commerce maintained without this form, and this is the form of the cross. 
For the sea is not traversed without this trophy of the cross, which is called a sail, abide safe in the ship. Right? Think of a mast and a sail on a ship. And the earth is not plowed without it. Diggers and craftsmen do not do their work except with tools which have this shape. Think of the top of a shovel or a pickaxe. And the human form differs from that of the irrational animals in nothing else than in its being erect and having the hands extended and having on the face extending from the forehead what is called the nose, through which there is respiration for the living creature. And this shows no other form than that of the cross. Right? Just in saying, when you look around the world, you see the cross everywhere. Or consider Tullian, Tertullian, writing at the end of the second, the beginning of the third century. In his work against Marcion, he refers to a passage from the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. He writes that the faithful are sealed with that mark of which Ezekiel speaks. The Lord said unto me, pass through in the midst of the gate, in the midst of Jerusalem, and set the mark tau on the foreheads of the men. Ezekiel 9.4. For this same letter tau of the Greeks, which is our T, Tertullian is writing in Latin, has the appearance of the cross, which he foresaw we should have on our foreheads in the true and Catholic Jerusalem. The mark on the foreheads is a letter. The letter is a tau, and the tau has the appearance of the cross. But of course, one doesn't have to go to the second or beginning of the third century in order to see the significance of the cross and of Christ crucified. For even a cursory glance at some of the earliest texts in the New Testament, namely the letters of Paul, reveals the significance of the cross for earliest reflection upon Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2.2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Or Galatians 6.14, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The cross and the crucifixion of Jesus that took place upon it is viewed as the locale in which the power of God and grace is revealed and it functions as a type of metaphor for the message of salvation. Thus, Erika Dinkler von Schubert rightly stated, quote, the cross becomes a symbol for the central salvific message of the Christian faith. Of course, the significance of the cross is fundamentally connected to Christ being the crucified one. Now, so in all likelihood, this is why Stauros, cross, is included among the sacred names. Yet it's not only that cross is a nomen sacrum, that is neither a name nor a title, it's also the only nomen sacrum with a ligature, with two letters that are written together. Here are images from three New Testament papyri written independently of each other in the second or third century. P45, P66, and P75, the papyrus we saw at the outset. In each of these, we see cross written as a nomen sacrum, and a stourogram, the T and the R, the tau and the rho, written together. Now, this use of a tau rho in and of itself does not necessarily have anything to do with Christianity, with Jesus, or with the cross. In fact, there are clear pre-Christian and non-Christian uses of the Tau Rho as it is found, for instance, as an auxiliary mark on the coins of King Herod that were minted in the third year of his reign, as well as in an abbreviation for other Greek words, such as tropos, manner, way something is done, or triakos, 30. At the same time, however, 
it's equally clear that the use of a tau row in early Christian manuscripts as a ligature within a nomen sacrum has no point of contact on the level of its meaning with the abbreviations using a tau row attested elsewhere in Greek texts. Now, this observation leads back to the fundamental questions concerning the significance of the cross as a nomen sacrum and the staurogram within it. Here we must remember that, as we have just seen, for early Christians, we have evidence that the cross was not simply a symbol of the power of God and of grace, nor merely a symbol that is found in the shapes observed by humanity throughout the world they live in, the cross is also symbolized by a letter, namely by the tau, the T. The point is that the Greek word for cross could be understood and seen as containing the Greek letter symbolizing the cross. Yet the staurogram is not simply a tau, a T, it is a compendium of a tau and a row. Why was the R, why was the row written on top of the tau in order to form the staurogram? I told you at the outset of this presentation that I am decidedly unqualified to speak about art history. I'm even more unqualified to attempt to draw anything because my artistic skills in the visual arts are profoundly awful. But surprisingly, my horrible drawing skills actually help explain what I think is going on here. What is the simplest and most basic way to draw a person? <laughs> Stick figure, right? Even I can draw that, all right? Now envision the Greek letter R, the row, and superimpose it on the stick figure. And then add the tau, the T, the cross. The explanation for the staurogram that several scholars have found most persuasive is that in the staurogram, one finds a simple illustration of a figure upon a cross with its head above the crossbeam of that cross. As Kurt Aland put it, the abbreviation resulted in an image of the one who was crucified. That is to say, within the nomen sacrum for the word cross, in itself already a visual depiction of the special significance this word had for many early Christians, one finds an image of Jesus drawn as a row, on the cross, drawn as a towel. The staurogram is here an illustration of the crucified one. As Robin Margaret Jensen puts it, the staurogram forms, quote, a kind of pictogram, the image of a man's head upon a cross, and seems to be an actual reference to the cross of crucifixion. If this assessment is correct, its significance should not be underestimated for it would mean that one of the earliest visual representations of Jesus is, in a simple yet striking way, a reception of Christ crucified. When Max Solzberger, in a 1925 study of the cross and other Christograms, argued that the key row does not exist as a Christian symbol prior to Constantine, and that the staurogram developed only later. It, the staurogram, appeared a little before the middle of the fourth century. This is entirely understandable because all of the papyri I have shown this evening were not yet discovered in 1925. But when in 2003, Graydon F. Snyder, former professor of New Testament Chicago Theological Seminary, wrote, there is no place in the third century for a crucified Christ, for basically the Christian cross first appears in the Constantinian sign, the Milvian Bridge Vision in 312 CE, the Labrum Quiro, then I must say that in my estimation, that is basically incorrect. 
A New Testament colleague in Regensburg, Germany, Tobias Nicholas, is absolutely right in noting the earliest Christian books already transmitted not only text, they visualize, at least in a few places, a critical aspect of the Christian confession of faith in the depiction of the stourgram, a basic image of the salvific event on the cross is presented and thus made present. The contraction and ligature creating the stourgram are, as Wolfgang Wischmeyer put it, the oldest Christian creation of a symbol and formation of a sign. In Christian theology and in Christian history, the cross, hostauros, is one of the most important symbols and bearers of theological meaning. And though I and my biblical studies colleagues most often, and indeed rightly, study and interact with the words of the texts we are studying, I would contend that it is also vitally important that in the study of early Christianity, we not only read the word of the cross in the earliest New Testament manuscripts, but also that we perceive the iconographical significance of the image of the cross and the earliest depiction of the crucified Christ in these very manuscripts. Thank you for your attention. Now, before moving into a time of Q&A, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments and formulate and perhaps distill your questions in conversation about this evening's presentation with those around you. If you would like, you can use these two questions as discussion starters, or you can discuss other impressions that you have. Take about five minutes for you to think about, formulate your questions, and then we will have a time of Q&A. So I hope that gave you a couple of minutes to reflect a little bit on this whole question of visual representation, New Testament manuscripts. I would at this point welcome your questions. Um, we'll see whether or not you welcome my answers, um, but please feel free. Hello, Professor. Thank you so much. What a wonderful lecture. Interesting. We don't often have a lecture on things such as symbols like that. It's usually straight the I'm glad you so didn't thank say you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad you didn't say we don't often have interesting lectures. So, so. Fascinating. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but I'm a little confused about the timeline with Constantine. Like that Melvin Bridge with the sign and the Kiro and all that. Did the, did the Stavros... Was it more prevalent after that? Like, was it state-sanctioned icons going forward, or was it existing before Constantine, and he just took advantage of that and used it? And my second question, if you don't mind, um, when did, like, I, somebody told me a long time ago that to wear a cross, a, a cruci a cross a, with a crucifix on it, with a body, to an early Christian would have been abhorrent. It would have been like in 1950 wearing like an electric chair thing on your chest, right? And so when did that become like it was okay to demonstrate the cross visually on your own body? Great. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question about Constantine, right? So, so, so Constantine and this vision were at the beginning of the 4th century. 312. After that period of time in the fourth century, you certainly see a major proliferation of Christian symbols because now Christianity has become the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so that proliferation does take place. You do then in the fourth century and subsequently start seeing the, the rise of the Stourogram as a freestanding symbol. So those two pictures that I showed at the beginning of the dome in the baptistry or uh, from Sinaiticus, a freestanding Tau Rho as a symbol for Jesus, 
uh, begins to appear and then occur. It is, however, not the earliest or the first appearance of the stourgram that we find in the fourth century and later as that freestanding symbol, but rather we already see it in New Testament manuscripts as part of that abbreviation for the word cross that I was, that I was showing tonight. So, so it's extant before that, and then it uh, proliferates and is used in new contexts subsequent to. Now, in terms of the question of wearing the cross, um, I think you're probably that, that comment that sometimes is made about wearing an electric chair or wearing a gallows is, is a reference to the idea that for the Romans, the cross is an instrument of execution. And it is, it is a torturous form of execution, right? Death on a cross actually occurs by asphyxiation. And what ends up happening is that the crucified individual becomes too tired to, to pull themselves up on the cross to get lung into the, the airs, and they, they asphyxiate on the cross. It's also the reason why you have the reference to the breaking of the legs. If you wanted someone to die quickly on the cross, if you break their legs, they can't push up anymore at all. They die pretty quickly. But it's a torturous form of execution. And so for the, for the Roman context, you sometimes hear that, that parallel. The idea that this instrument of death and torture and execution would become a symbol of salvation and life, that's only through the connection that it has with Christ. So for early Christians, there was a complete reinterpretation of this symbol. The use of it as a symbol is exactly what I was talking about this evening. I do think it starts showing up in Christian manuscripts uh, in the second and third century. But the reflection on the cross as something that, on the one hand, is foolishness, right? That's the Pauline language for it doesn't make any sense, right, to have this conception of a cross in Paul's language for those who are perishing, but for Christians who have reinterpreted because of their interpretation of the Christ event, it comes to be a symbol that means something completely different. Right? So for early Christians, I would argue it never has that association like wearing an electric chair or a gallows. But outside of Christian circles, the use of this symbol would be strange because it's what are you doing with a sign of Roman torture as your religious symbol. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you thought the abbreviation for Jesus Christ to God was related to the Jewish custom of not saying Yahweh or, or leaving out the vowels when we write it. Right, and, and that's, of course, one of the things that we also see in, uh, in Jewish manuscripts is the Tetragrammaton not being written in the script of the rest of, of, of the manuscript. Sometimes it's written in Paleo-Hebrew or in different lettering. Sometimes it's in a different color. Uh, so there's a, there's, there's a marking of the sacred name in, in Hebrew uh, texts as well. Um, the idea that there is significance with a sacred name, right, that I think is, is not unrelated. The, the challenge in terms of trying to think about the visual phenomenon is that the practice of abbreviation and the use of the superlinear stroke and, and these ways of signifying that sacred name, right? That someone is doing something different in a text with a sacred name is not unique to early Christianity. But the particular visual form of it, these nomina sacra, is something that, as far as we know, is unique to early Christian scribal culture. To the extent, like I mentioned in my talk, that when papyrologists are looking at papyri and see nomina sacra, that in and of itself is usually almost enough to say this has a Christian provenance. This is, this is the context that this, that this comes from. Uh, thank you. This was really, really interesting. And I'm just curious, um, because the papyri were meant to be read, why would you do this? 
Is it a heuristic device for a preacher? I mean, this isn't an icon to be venerated, you know, or even to be displayed very publicly. It's just, it's a very private thing to be doing. So are there theories as to why this would have been done in the case of the Stavrogram? Right. Uh, and that, of course, is related to that, to the fact that we don't have any indication that this changed anything in terms of how these words were pronounced or, or read, right? It, it wouldn't sound any different. And of course, in, in antiquity, since most individuals were illiterate, your interaction with the text was through hearing it. And you wouldn't hear it any differently when it was read from a manuscript that had Namana Sacra. Now, of course, you would be familiar with writing. There's inscriptions, there's, there's, there's writing around you. But in terms of being able to do anything with it, to understand anything, you had, you had to hear it. And that's really one of the things that's so interesting about this, that it does appear to be a visual phenomenon. And as a visual phenomenon, we often think of it as part of Christian scribal culture. Right, which means that it's it's kind of it's 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 limited to those individuals that are writing, and then later, if individuals are reading, subsequently reading the text, they would they would see it. Um, but it, if it's connected to some type of expression of a theological significance, it's it's a purely visual expression on a text that's not going to be publicly displayed as such, and yet they still did it, and still found it important enough to do that it kind of becomes established as this is, this is what Christians do when they write their text, when they copy their text, and when they write certain names. Um, so I would not see it as connected to a widely public type of veneration, but it is a visual expression, in my estimation, of theological significance that for whatever reason, and I can't climb into the mind of an individual scribe or of early scribal culture, but what I can see is that they thought it was significant enough or important enough to do it. I wanted to have you comment on the, the view of it as a visual icon and the interpretation that the human person has when they look at a visual thing. I, I heard a, a homily one day by Sean, uh, Cardinal Sean. He talked about how the eyes are very uh, interpretive quickly as opposed to um, when you read something and have, you have to put it into your mind and think about it. There's a completely different interpretation. Okay, I have a feeling that question is moving outside of my area of expertise in terms of, of psychology. But, but, what, but what is certainly the case, and I might, I might want to push back just a little bit, that for everyone, a visual reception is, is more quickly or, or, or taken in more. Because, if, for example, in, in learning, we know that there are different types of learners. Right, people that are more inclined to visual learning, others that are more inclined to auditory learning. Right, There are things going on in our brains, and I'd have to defer to my neurology and neurosurgeon <laughs> colleagues in terms of what exactly those, those pathways are, in terms of how we uptake information. Right? But that there are a variety of ways in which we receive input, that's certainly true. And what I think we see in early Christian manuscripts, and this is where... I think I, I'm competent to say something about, is that it seems that the early Christian scribes were not merely interested or concerned with reproducing the words so that they could be read correctly, because that could have been done without any abbreviations, without a stourogram, without a superlinear stroke, right? that there is at least an additional concern to do something with these texts that make them more, as I said at the beginning, more than simply receptacles for words. Right? We think of books, if I simply say a book, we think of that as words, as text. I have to add something like an illustrated book or something to, to start bringing up pictures of, of, of images. But it seems if we're thinking along those lines, that even before you get the majestic illustrated manuscripts, right, with these beautiful 
drawings and then later in the Middle Ages, it seems that that interested in a certain sense of having an illustrated book. If we think of that in the most basic way of including visual phenomena in addition to texts, then my argument is we see that as early as we have New Testament manuscripts. Stephen is the first martyr. Is there an etymological connection with Stephen and Stavros, Stavros cross? Um, Stephen comes from Stephanos, which ah. is the Greek for crown. Okay. So, would be nice if there were, but <laughs> no, yeah. Professor Roth, I'm enjoying your lecture tremendously. I have a question. If these papyri, I assume they're from Egypt, and I'm, and I'm looking at that starogram that it, it, maybe I'm not seeing well, but it looked like an ankh, you know? Maybe they're, you know, have some influence. Right, and, and there, has, there has been a suggestion about that. So, so, so the ankh is a symbol that looks very similar to the starogram, an Egyptian symbol for life. Um, there, there has been some reflection on potential connections, um, right? That's uh, similar to the way in which um, Hurtado was thinking about the number 18 with, he with Hebrew uh, connections, right? So the, the, there is, there's speculation and thinking about and quite a bit of debate concerning the, the origin of this, right? Um, if there is that connection, which would be another life connection, right? Um, it does seem that in, in Christianity, it is fairly quickly and maybe even often, almost immediately reinterpreted as it's now being used in Stauros for a, a Christian purpose, right? Um, and, and yes, of course, almost all of our papyri come from Egypt, um, for the simple reason is that you, 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 know, you need a desert. You need a desert to preserve papyri. Um, papyri is, is, is a plant, right? It I mean, probably most of us at some point, we've been reading something and we had our drink and we knocked it over and it got on the pages and you see how quickly the pages of your book or whatever kind of <laughs> curl up and, and you realize that, well, if, if the paper really gets wet, it gets destroyed. And so all of the places that we're writing on papyri where it's wet, it's not going to be around for a couple thousand years to, uh, to be found. Um, except in one instance in England where there was a papyri and it was immediately sealed by clay and it created a hermetical seal, so it was preserved. So we have a papyri find out of England. But just about everything else is Egypt. That was for free. It had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could you give us a sense of after the Stourogram, what the development is of the depiction of the crucified Jesus in art or in, you mentioned illuminated manuscripts from the medieval period. Um, with those, would we see a progression from like the stick figure, if the stargram is a stick figure, to a fully fledged depiction of it, you know, a, a lifelike figure, or does it simply jump to that? I'm going to refer to my comment at the outset of my lecture that I'm decidedly unqualified <laughs> to make any significant comments on art history. Uh, the, the little bit that I do know is that, of course, we do, ha we do have a development in art. And, of course, you know, kind of what we think of as sacred art is, is, one, of the right, is one of the predominant forms of art. And there is there's development in art that also affects the, the depiction of the crucifixion or even of Jesus uh, for, for that matter, that does take place as art develops. But unfortunately, more than that kind of generality in terms of the actual development of the artistic depictions, I'm not qualified to comment on, and so I won't. <laughs> Unlike what we professors sometimes do, and we prattle on and on about something we have no business talking about. <laughs> oh, I'm not supposed to say it. Okay. Cut that out of the video before it goes online. <laughs> Hi.
Hi, um, this is more of a comment than a question, but I'd like to see what you think. Um, I had a, we in our little discussion. I had a theory, and then what you just said about the desert kind of drove my theory home. If I, I think. Um, so, so, what do you think um, that the intent of the scribe might have been? Well, the fact that the papyrus were hidden in the desert, as you said, or just kept in the desert, shows intent. Um, for survival for like a couple of thousand years. And what if the scribes, you know, actually just consider this and realize that maybe a couple of thousand years down the road, language would have changed, as is the case. Um, and of course, they would have had no chance of fathoming like modern technology and modern science that right now um, the language is not a barrier because we have this. But wouldn't the easiest way to ensure that that truth survived would be, you know, the visual depiction of that. So I, th I think that the fact that they were kept in the desert also shows um, intent for it being a picture. Like, yeah, does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, a couple of things to say there. Uh, first, um, there are clearly some things that we have found where it seems to have been an intention to hide them, to preserve them. So the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. In, in caves outside of Qumran, it seems that there was a library that was put into the caves probably when the Romans were coming down in the first century to, to preserve them. Um, but a lot of what we find is not in any way material that was set aside intended to be preserved. In fact, one of our absolute largest finds of papyri in Egypt is in a place called Oxyrhynchus. And where we find it in Oxyrhynchus is in the trash heaps. So a bunch of papyri that we're discovering and that we are excited to have is what they were throwing away. So that's part of what we have to remember that a lot of what we have from antiquity is just kind of fortuitous that we found it somewhere. Not a planned preservation. It would be nice. It would be wonderful. It's also the reason why so many of our papyri are incredibly fragmentary. Right? They're, they're broken. It's partly the material, but it's also partly it, it wasn't preserved in ideal um, situation. So we're always hopeful that we will continue to find things that are in a, in a better state, right, that they were either buried at some point or that were hidden in, in, a, in a cave. But at the same time, we are dealing with our historical sources largely just with what happened to stand the test of time and that we put our hands on.